Robert Bastian here, and my discussion is about lowered muscular ceiling. And because some people just want a very quick explanation, I'll try to do a very quick review in the beginning, and then we'll go into a PowerPoint that's a little more detailed. So the ceiling of the voice is the sort of upper limit, primarily the singing voice. And if we didn't have an upper ceiling of our voice, we would sing infinitely higher, higher and higher. There comes a place where we just can't go any higher. That ceiling can be imposed by uh, damage to the surface tissue of the vocal cords. That's a kind of upper voice laryngitis, uh, nodules, polyps, uh, or even uh, viral laryngitis, whatever. But what I want to talk about is the limitation on the upper range due to muscle difficulty, that the muscles are working too hard and limiting our upper voice and the ceiling is coming down. Now, in the, the majority of people, uh, it will be uh, in relation to menopause, a few years before menopause, in menopause or after menopause. But it is a phenomenon that's seen in other voices as well for less uh, clear reasons. It's seen in a lot of young singers who are who are uh, lifting the voice to the top rather than dangling the voice from the ceiling. Um, the the uh, explanation is that muscles that don't need to be involved are starting to try to help. Uh, you you all know the phenomenon of try uh, you know picking up something that's kind of bulky and a little bit heavy and somebody says oh let me help you with that and they come and they tilt it the wrong way or something and so you end up saying oh it's okay just just let me handle it it their their help actually hurts well it's like that the the surrounding muscles uh, of, of the voice box here the surrounding muscles begin to participate in a way that's unhelpful and so the key to the upper, the, the lowered muscular ceiling is to figure out how to get certain muscles out of the way. Don't help me. Uh, so that's the quick um, and dirty uh, description of the, of the phenomenon. So for those of you who want more, uh, let me share my screen. Here we go with the PowerPoint. <clears throat> so again, lowered muscular ceiling uh, muscular tension dysphonia is a highly related idea, and perimenopausal voice changes, sometimes what I call it, almost making one equal to the other, but it, they're not quite equal, but they're highly related. Um, so uh, just so you know where we're speaking from, this is the western suburbs of Chicago, 20 miles west of the downtown, and uh, right in the center of the metro area. Um, this is where the building where Laryngopedia and Bastion Voice Institute reside. Bastion Voice Institute, my clinical uh, institute, is th uh, three physicians here, me, Dr. Richardson, Dr. Hosley, and our physician assistant, uh, Melissa Wingo. All of us uh, trained singers, though we do full service laryngology, there is a subset of our group that are singers and it helps very much for us to, uh, to be able to understand singing as actual singers. Uh, a lot of people uh, watch something like this and they want another resource. Well, Laryngopedia, you can go there and just type into the search window the word ceiling and a couple of posts will come up. I think the second one here has an audio example for you. Actually, I'm going to change glasses here. Um, so uh, now, background. My diagnostic process, because people do things differently and, you know, different strokes for different folks, no problem. But my diagnostic process includes an insightful history of the problem. Yeah, I, I understand underlined story because it's your story. What is it that's happening? What won't happen that should and we have a conversation, and by the end of it, I have to kind of say, I really get what it is that's the problem in detail. I know what you're talking about. Then we go to elicitation of vocal phenomenology. I ask the voice to do certain things, and then the, when the person complies with trying that task, like, yay, and, and I hear what happens when the other person tries to do that, and I have them shout, or I have them sustain, or I do a variety of things with the voice, <clears throat> and I come up with a, a sort of a, a direct voice-on-voice -voice understanding of the phenomenology 
and then a not a far fuzzy exam, but a close clear exam, uh, usually using video so that the person can see it. That's what we call the integrative diagnostic model. So when the problem is the lowered muscular ceiling, what's the history, what's the vocal phenomenology, and what's the exam? I'll show you in turn here. Now, key parts of the story, the history, the person usually says it's predominantly singing voice. I'm not really bothered as a speaker, but when I sing, that's the issue. And they go on to say it's my upper range that's the, the that's so difficult. It's effortful to reach that upper voice, or I can touch high notes. I still vocalize to my usual high notes, but I can't live up there. I can't sustain high voice singing. A, a song that lies high in my range is just too much work. Uh, tendency of the pitch to sag. I've always been a great pitch matcher, and now people tell me sometimes, you know, you're sagging just a little bit on the pitch. Maybe registered divergence, but that's a big subject on its own, so I'll leave that alone. And then neck discomfort, especially deep paralaryngeal, they say, oh my goodness, if I have to sustain or sing really high in my range, it just aches. It feels so much work and it aches in here. And that's the pharynx contracting inappropriately. Uh, pharynx isn't made for sustained contraction. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so that's the story. What or the history? What about the elicited phenomenology? And I'm going to exaggerate some of this for clarity. Well, there's a sound of effort in the upper voice. So instead of happy birthday to you, that feels sounds effortless, I think. And instead, and I'll exaggerate, it becomes happy birthday to you. Do you hear that? Uh, that there's a little effort in that sound. Happy birthday to you. It's just too much work. It's a pushed up quality rather than a dangled down quality. Loss of spin. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. It's, a, it's loss of that spin and brightness in the pitch. Uh, little driven sounding and sagging pitch. And the running into the clothesline problem, I'll, I'll exaggerate that. The person goes, I'll start a little lower. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And they just kind of, it's almost like they ran into a clothesline. There just comes a place where they just can't do that anymore. Well, um, what are the physical findings? Closure from the outside closure of the thyrohyoid space. I'm going to show this to you, not in my tiny little window in a minute, but the, we're going to look at the larynx in more detail, but there's a space between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage, and that begins to close, and the larynx tends to rise, and the pharynx is contracting, and that's the thing that you can't see, but the thyrohyoid space can be used as a proxy. When this narrows, pharynx is also contracting, so we're going to teach you how to use this as a way of, of monitoring whether the pharynx is contracting or not. And the pharynx, again, is contracting at an inappropriately low pitch. Um, it has to contract eventually. A, a soprano, a world-famous lyric soprano, you look at her pharynx at high C, C6, uh, over 1,000 hertz, and you're going to see some pharynx participation and you get her to do a D and an E and an F way up in the stratosphere. And her pharynx is going to progressively uh, contract. But see, that's at an appropriate point of the range. What you don't want is that that pharynx contraction begins to happen too low in the range. Uh, so what is the role of the pharynx in producing voice? Let's back up a little bit. Well, uh, it shouldn't really participate. It should stay open uninvolved. Now, some people talk about it being ten tensing as a sort of resonator, but the point is it's not shortening its fibers and clenching like this. It's it's uncontracted. Un, uh, and again, it begins to contract in every voice that nears its ceiling. So when you near the appropriate ceiling, your pharynx begins to participate. Uh, the problem is if it contracts too low in the range. So I've got a picture to show you. 
So here's this, the model of the, the head. You see the lips have muscle in them. You see the tongue has a big muscle in it. The larynx has muscles in it. The palate here has muscles. But look at this thin little strip of muscle on the back wall of the throat. Now, if we turn this model on its face, uh, oh, oh I, before I do that, the pharynx musculature, this thin little strip of muscle is made for brief. It's made to go mm, lift and then let go, or it, you know, it contracts when we swallow. So I go and it went mm, and let go. But if I make the pharynx go mm, and it's contracting and contracting, it says, wait a minute, this isn't my job to, to sustain contraction. I'm a, a momentary contractor. Uh, so in other words, my arms are made to lift and carry heavy books down the hall. The pharynx isn't made. Maybe it could lift the books, figuratively speaking, but it doesn't want to carry them down the hall. That's too sustained of a contraction. Well, how is it viewed from inside? And remember, we have the person now on their nose and we're looking online uh, to, down towards the feet. So into the screen is to the feet. So here are two different sopranos. Soprano one is on the left, up and down on the left. Soprano two is on the right, up and down. Here is a pharynx that is uncontracted. Do you see the wide open piriform sinuses? The airy epiglottic fold is far away from the pharynx and the, the curvature of the pharynx is, is fairly flat. Look over here, the lower right. Here is a pharynx in massive contraction, squeezing the, the larynx. The piriform sinuses are no longer seen. The pharynx is almost touching the area epiglottic fold. This is what you cannot do in other than a momentary way. Pharynx will do that like this, but it won't do it like this sustained way. So look at soprano one, upper left, B flat three. That's very low in her range. And the pharynx is uninvolved. Now here below, she's singing an octave above that. So this is B flat above middle C. And you can see the pharynx is beginning to get just a little bit more of a rounded uh, shape. So it's beginning to participate. And that soprano on the left, the two pictures on the left, she's already having a little bit of lowered muscular ceiling, but it's not extreme. The soprano on the right, different voice, is here at B flat three, just like over here. There's not much contraction of the pharynx. But here at B flat four, same pitch as this one. So on the left is B flat four. On the right is B flat four, and they're both sopranos. And which one is saying, oh my goodness, my upper voice, I just, uh, I can't, I just can't do it. Well, it's the one on the right. She's just having terrible trouble with a very drastically lowered muscular ceiling. Well, thoughts about how to fix a lowered muscular ceiling. Learn the landmarks of your neck. Obsess about ice tongs using your fingers as ice finger and thumb as ice tongs not like this but as as ice tongs <clears throat> and use the thyrohyoid space as a proxy for pharynx contraction in other words if the thyrohyoid space that you're feeling with your ice tongs narrows the pharynx is also contracting and vice versa uh, so here we see landmarks in the male it's easier the male larynx is bigger and the angle of the front of the is, is angled like this. In women, it's flatter and, of course, smaller. And so you don't feel the thyroid cartilage as well. And in fact, in many women, it's the cricoid, the lower cartilage, that's more prominent. So if a woman feels her neck and she feels something prominent, it's more likely to be the, th the cricoid cartilage. So what the female will do is to feel for the prominence and then feel slowly below that. And if you don't feel another hard thing, then you know, okay, this bottom prominence is the cricoid. Then you feel up a tiny bit and you can feel a little tiny space. That's this space between that. It's called the cricothyroid membrane. And then now you feel something else that's hard. It's maybe not as prominent. It's sort of flatter, but you can feel that there's something hard there. And then you come up and you feel that you're reaching the top of it. Then you go lateral and you have to rise a little bit because the larynx rises and you inter you put your thumb here and your finger here. But again, not in a standard tongs way, but in an ice tongs way. OK, so let me leave the screen share and show it to you now in a bigger format.
<clears throat> so I'm going to identify my thyroid notches there and I feel upwards and I feel this that here I'm on the thyroid notch and then you can see my finger can sink in to the soft space. Then I take my thumb and my finger and I'm doing ice tongs. Let me do it with my other hand. I'm doing ice tongs and I'm feeling up above, there's my hyoid bone. And the mistake people often make is they go way far back. This is quite far forward on the neck. And uh, I can feel the space. Now, if I want to exaggerate the space for purposes of identification, I kind of simulate a yawn, a gentle yawn, not a forced yawn, but a sort of a gentle, just kind of let the leg go lower, or I sing a low pitch. And that's going to tend to open the space. And now I interdigitate and I get myself set. There I am, right there. And then I do. And there comes the place where it does close and it does want to rise. But if that's very high in my range, that's okay. It's just that you don't want to let it happen. You want to resist. You want to, to de-recruit that closure of the that space as long as you can, as high as you can in the voice. So high palate, uh, that sense of space in the throat, and then you experiment and you you think all sorts of different thoughts. You squeeze your abdomen, you raise your palate higher, and you see what can I do a lot of your initial singing would be low in your range because you're having to really identify and and corral that space. <clears throat> now, why do I ask you to identify your landmarks? And by the way, uh, there are going to be people who watch this and they're going to try to identify and they're, they're, they can't do it. They, they're not sure where they are. Well, you might need a few days or even weeks to get to the place where you say, okay, I really get it. You go to the internet, type in larynx and do images and you'll see pictures of, of the larynx like this. And you, you know, you just keep feeling and saying, is that the bottom hard thing? Uh, okay, is there that little dent of the cricothyroid space? And then, okay, I feel something else hard. And then there's something soft here and I can feel the hyoid bone above. So you have to work at it uh, in some, uh, people, if there's a, a little extra layer of adipose that uh, fat, or fat, that can make it a little harder. But if you work at it and work at it, you will figure it out. Don't expect to do it instantly. I'm, But you should get to the place where you can pretty quickly, after some days, weeks, months of really figuring out this these landmarks, you should get to the place where when you go into the studio to, to warm up or to sing, you instantly find that space. Now, uh, I would get a voice qualified speech pathologist or a good singing teacher to help you with this, but they will do it mostly through this, that sound of pushed up. They'll do it through the, the sound, through the flatting, and they'll do it through the palate, they'll do it through imagery, but you meanwhile can be doing it by monitoring the landmarks here. If you keep the space wide, the pharynx is uncontracted. If the space narrows, your pharynx is participating too much. Now. Uh, to fix this lowered muscular ceiling is a, for many people, it's a little bit of a mountain to climb. So people say, well, I want, okay, I got my landmarks. Now I want to just fix this problem. Well, it's not quite that easy. You have to work at it and work at it for weeks and months, uh, pr uh, trying different things, squeeze the abdomen more, but keep the, the neck relaxed, raise the palate higher you know, all the things that singers do to kind of to explore and figure out how to make the sound or, or what you're going to do. So be patient, be persistent, be prepared to get a little sore here and here uh, where you've been pin using your ice tongs and uh, just keep at it. Uh, so there it is. There's the probably too much information approach to lowered muscular ceiling. And thanks very much for listening.